Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, and while you're turning there or scrolling there, uh, I want to ask you this question. Uh, It's an important question that uh, I think matters a lot, uh, and it's this, uh, who is your favorite superhero? Uh, If someone asks you, I think you can tell a lot about someone by who their favorite superhero is. Maybe it's uh, Batman or Superman. If you ask my son, it's Spider-Man as his uh, favorite superhero. Uh, We all have these superheroes that we like for one reason or another. And depending on when you ask me, mine changes from time to time. But right now, my favorite superhero is the unlikely, but I think no less respectable Scooby-Doo. Right, uh, I think Scooby-Doo is an underrated superhero uh, who uh, is uh, worthy of respect and honor. Uh, th- think about Scooby-Doo here for just a minute. He's a dog, right? But he's better than Pluto because he, he can understand. He, he can kind of talk with us, kind of can't talk with us. Uh, he can keep up with this ragtag group of teenagers as they solve these mysteries. And he's typically the one who figures it out in the end. Now, one of the reasons that I love Scooby-Doo, and, I, and I've always appreciated uh, that piece of artistic cinema, is I, I love the way that uh, those crimes are often solved. Right? You get to the end of the show, and they rip the mask off the bad guy. More often than not, it's someone they already knew. Right? It's someone that they wouldn't have expected. It's someone that they, they thought that this was a good guy. Right? They, they thought that this was someone they could trust. They, they thought that this was a good person. And yet when the mask comes off, they realize, oh, this is who was guilty all along. And I think that one of the reasons that maybe Scooby-Doo resonates with me, and, and I think probably resonates with many people, is because Scooby-Doo gets at one of the deepest fears of the human heart, and it's this that we would be exposed as something that we really are, right? That we, we put on this mask or we, we put on this facade. And one of the great fears is that people would find out that we're not as good as we say we are or we're not as good as we think we are or, or we're not as this or, or we're not as that. As we look here at First Peter this morning, what we're gonna see is that oftentimes we have already exposed ourselves. We've already revealed ourselves. So as we look at this passage, what, what we see here in First Peter chapter two is this, is that how we live reveals what we believe about God. How we live reveals what we believe about God. We could say it this way, how we live exposes what we believe about God. And so Peter's writing in this passage, these two verses that we're going to look at this morning, and he's writing to help us see this, right? To, to help us understand that how we live, it reveals, it exposes what we believe about God. But that doesn't have to be bad news, right? That can actually be good news if we're believing the right things and if as we believe the right things, we're living in the right way. So look with me here at First Peter chapter 2. Uh, We're going to look at verses 11 and 12. Let me invite you to stand as we uh, honor the reading of God's perfect and precious word here in 1 Peter chapter 2. Starting in verse 11, we read this. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This is God's word. You can be seated. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we need your mercy today. Father, we need your mercy today just like we needed it yesterday. Father, we pray that you would show us your mercy, you would show us your grace, you would show us your glory by speaking to us through your word. Father, we know that you've already spoken even as we've read your word, and Lord, we pray that you would keep speaking, you would keep applying your word to our hearts, because God, we need it this morning. Father, we pray this and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. How we live it exposes what we believe about God. And so that means that we need to think about the right ways to live. And, and Peter helps us do just that. He shows us two ways that we must live. And so first we see this, that we've got to live like Jesus is better than your sin. You've got to live like Jesus is better than your sin. See, here's at its root, here's what sin is. 
Sin is the lie that Jesus isn't enough. Sin is the lie that Jesus can't give you what something else will give you. That Jesus can't provide for you what something else might provide for you. That, that Jesus can't do what you need. And, and here's what we, we understand about that is that's a lie. And we, we sin whenever we believe that lie and we, we give in to that lie. And so Peter is writing here, he's encouraging us, he's calling us to live the truth. Right? He's calling us to live like Jesus is better than our sin. Now, he's determined as he's writing this letter that his readers, that his audience would live a holy life. We've seen that through this passage. We've seen that through this book, that that we would live a life that's marked by Jesus and that we would live a life that is serious about holiness. And he's, he's writing to this group of believers who they're suffering, but he's adamant that suffering for the gospel is not an excuse to abandon holiness. That suffering for Jesus is not a good reason to abandon living for Jesus. That holiness, in fact, is actually the key to thriving in suffering. That holiness is what we need if we are going to thrive and if we are going to live. Now, the last few weeks as we've walked through this book, maybe you you remember that that Peter's been calling us to holiness. He's been calling us to a holy life. But he's been calling us to this holiness in general. Now what's happening is here in verse 11, we actually have a shift in the section of the book. And so we're beginning a new section in 1 Peter. Now some of you are saying, Ethan, this is chapter 2, right? That new section already started. A lot of chapters and verses, right, they were added later. They're, they're not perfect. And so what we have is we have this new section in 1 Peter opening up for us where he is going to get really specific and really practical on what holiness looks like. He's going to get really specific on, and really practical on what it means for us to live holy lives. So look at verse 11. He says, beloved. Now, we can stop right there. He addresses his readers. He addresses his people as a pastor. He wants them to feel the affection and the love that he has for them. The, the word that's translated here, it's actually, it's literally beloved by God. You who are loved by God. Now, some translations will say beloved friends or brothers and sisters or friends, something like that, but it's, it's literally beloved, beloved by God. He, he wants his people, he wants his readers to feel the love that God has for them, but he also wants them to feel and to know the love that he has for them. Because what Peter's gonna do is he's gonna say some difficult things. He's going to say some some hard things in this letter. And what he wants them to know is he's not saying hard things because he's trying to heap burden on them. He's not saying hard things because he wants to make their lives more difficult. He's going to tell them hard things because he loves them. And, And maybe you know this, but sometimes the most loving thing you can do for someone is tell them a hard truth. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do for them is tell them a difficult truth. And so Peter, he's going to write, he's going to tell them, look, you need to live a holy life. Understand, right? He's writing to this group who they're suffering because they're believers. They're, They're suffering because they're Christians. And so if they're like me and if maybe they're like you, they get this letter from Peter. Now, Peter is the apostle. He's the, the right hand of Jesus, that they would have known this. They get this letter, and if they're, they're like me, they are hoping that Peter is gonna say something like, hey, hit him where it hurts, right? Return evil for evil, right? Whatever they do to you, do it back to them and more. But that's not what Peter says. Peter says, hey, I know you're suffering, and I'm not excited about your suffering. You've got to live a holy life if you want to thrive in this environment, if you want to, to thrive where you are. So look there at verse 11 again. He says, Beloved, I, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, 
He brings their identity to the forefront once again. Over and over, just in the first chapter and a half of this book, Peter keeps bringing this identity. He, he keeps bringing this idea of you are sojourners, you are strangers, you are exiles. He, he keeps bringing that in front of them so that they will understand and they will feel this truth. That they are strangers in a strange place for a short time. That's what you and I are. That's the identity of every believer. That we are sojourners in this world. And because we're sojourners in this world, because we're strangers in this world, what that means is we have to live like it. We have to live our identity. We have to live as sojourners. We have to live as strangers. We have to live as exiles. Now he's writing to this group who they are recent converts. They're primarily a Gentile group. What that means is that this group knows what it means to feel at home in the world. This group knows what it means to taste the pleasures that the world can offer. This group, they, they know what it means to live the good life according to the standards of the world. But remember who it is that has made them exiles. They haven't become exiles simply because they decided to join a church. They haven't become exiles simply because they decided to do some things or believe some things. No, they became exiles because God made them exiles. Because when God saves us, that's what he does, right? He, he changes our identity and he makes us exiles. And so he says, look, be, because you are an exile, you have a new identity with new allegiance and new desire. And because you're, you're sojourners and you're strangers, look what Peter calls us to do. He says, abstain from the passions of the flesh. This passions of the flesh, this is a, a desire to sin. It's a, a desire for what is forbidden. Right, that he, he's acknowledging that we all have this temptation to sin. And the reason that we are tempted to sin is because we enjoy sin. Right? No one sins because they don't like it. No one says, you know what, I am tempted to do this thing. And I'll just be honest with you, I hate it. Right? It's like pulling teeth. No, we sin because we enjoy it. Right? We, we sin because it feels good. Now, sometimes we can say, like Paul said in Romans 7, that what I want to do, I do not do, and what I do not do, what I do not want to do, I do. Right, that we feel that. Like, I don't want to sin, but I keep sinning, and the reason I keep sinning is because it's what my flesh wants. It's because it feeds my flesh. It, it, it feeds that desire to sin inside of me. Now, the passions of the flesh here, this isn't just one category of sin. So sometimes maybe we're tempted to read the passions of the flesh and we're tempted to think, well, this is just like, like one kind of sin. Or this is, he's just talking about a sexual sin or he's just talking about this kind of sin or that kind of sin. But passions of the flesh are any kind of sin. It's a desire to engage, to be tempted with any kind of sin. Now notice Peter doesn't warn against just the really bad sins. He doesn't say to abstain from the really terrible sins. He, he doesn't say to abstain from the really public sins. No, he says abstain from all sin, from all of the passions of the flesh. Now this flesh, this is what is in us that constantly desires sin. Right, those passions, they, they belong to the world, but Peter said, we don't. We, we don't belong to the world. And so we've been called to be self-controlled through the power of the Spirit. To understand that, that the one who saved us also changes us. That, that Jesus loves you too much to save you and leave you exactly like you are. Right? Jesus loves you enough to not only save you and to change your eternity, but he loves you enough to save you and to change you right now so that you can have fellowship with him, so that you can walk with him. And now this flesh, this is what's in us that constantly desires sin. And so maybe, maybe whenever you're tempted, maybe you, you think, well, that is the enemy. And oftentimes it is the enemy. Or maybe whenever you sin, maybe you've heard the old comedian, he would say, the devil made me do it. But what Peter says here is that the enemy might tempt you but the flesh causes you to sin, right? That, that, that old man that is inside of you that you've got to constantly be putting to death to abstain from the passions of the flesh. 
that we've got to constantly be at war against this passion or against this flesh. And why? Well, look at verse 11. He says, they wage war against your soul. They're coming after you. Understand this. Sin is never neutral. Sin is always seeking to destroy you. It's always seeking to kill you. And here, here's something that, that I think we need to remember. Is that private sin is just as dangerous as public sin. Your private sins that no one knows about are maybe even more dangerous than the sins that they do know about. Your flesh is waging war against your soul. And Satan knows that because Satan's waging war against your soul as well. And maybe when we think about the attacks of Satan, maybe we think that Satan attacks with nuclear bombs. That Satan throws these big bombs and that's how he attacks. And so if we can just watch those big bombs, we can just step out of the way and they'll miss us. But that's actually not the way that Satan attacks. See, Satan is patient He's cunning, he's wise. And so far more than these big bombs, what Satan does is he sets little traps. He doesn't throw a big bomb, but he sets little landmines. And what happens is, is we step on them and we don't realize it, right? We, we step on them and maybe we feel it a little bit, but, but it's not that bad. And then what happens though is we, we keep stepping on these landmines and we think, I shouldn't have stepped there, but it'll be okay, it's not that big of a deal. I shouldn't have stepped there. It it's, kind of hurts, but it, it, it'll be okay. We, we keep stepping on these landmines. And what happens is every attack that, that we step on, every sin that we give into, what it does is it makes us weaker and it makes us weaker, and it makes us weaker, and it makes us weaker. And what happens, the reason the house falls down, the reason we implode spiritually is not because Satan hits us with a wrecking ball, but it's because we are weak. We take one more small hit, and everything falls apart. And may, maybe you've seen people who this has happened to, and, and you can't believe just the implosion that's happened in their life. But understand this, that that implosion did not happen on accident. That implosion did not happen suddenly. What happened was small compromises and small sins led to real pain, led to real destruction, led to real heartache. So we should be on the lookout for massive attacks from Satan because I think Satan is content to attack us in any way he can. We should be on the lookout for big attacks from Satan, but just as much, we should be on the lookout for the small bombs for the small landmines. When, when we think something like that sin isn't that big of a deal, that's a dangerous place to be. When, when we think I couldn't fall there, that's a dangerous place to be. When, when we think, hey, I'm feeling pretty good about where I am, that is exactly where Satan wants you to be. Because do you remember what the scriptures say? Pride comes before the fall. A healthy place to be is, but by the grace of God, there go I. See, our, our heart lies to us and it says, hey, I'm strong, I'm good, I'm, I'm doing well. Jeremiah 17 though, remember what it says? The heart is deceitfully wicked above all things, who can know it? So we've got to constantly be vigilant, constantly be, be looking out for these, uh, these sins or these, uh, these passions of the flesh that are dangerous, that are waging war against our soul. See, the, the greatest threat to your soul isn't the strange world that you live in, but it's the flesh that lives in you. It's the flesh that is at work in you. And so how do we abstain from the passions of the flesh? Here's how you abstain from the passions of the flesh. You starve the flesh. How do you starve the flesh? You starve the flesh by feasting on Jesus. Right? You, you starve the flesh by getting more and more of Jesus. Maybe, maybe you've heard of Brian Shaw. My guess is you haven't. Uh, Brian Shaw is a professional athlete. He's a four-time world's strongest man. Dude is six foot eight. Um, he deadlifts a thousand pounds. He squats 900 pounds. He, he benches 530 pounds. That's a lot of pounds, right? Like that, that, that's a lot of muscle. 
Uh, One of the things that he does, though, one of the reasons that he can do that is because every day he eats right over 10,000 calories. Now, I want to try it once, right? Like, I, I know, I don't think that I could deadlift or squat or bench any of that, but I think there's a chance, right? Like, like I think I could hit that goal, maybe, maybe once. But I was listening to an interview with him about him having to eat 10,000 calories a day. And he talks about how, like, at first you think, like, 10,000 calories, like, man, he just eats, you know, all kinds of great food. And he said, really what it is, is eating becomes a job. Because you're constantly having to remind yourself, I need to eat. I need to eat. I, I need to eat. And, and he said, what it is, is it becomes a, a discipline. I'm like, yeah, a, a discipline to eat cheesecake at night. I'm sorry, right? Uh, but it's a discipline to, to constantly be doing those things. And, and the reason that he can deadlift 1,000 pounds and squat 900 pounds and bench 530 pounds, the reason he can do all that is because he feasts regularly. But he doesn't just feast regularly. He's also disciplined his body. That's the way we abstain from the passions of the flesh. The the way that we starve the flesh is by this, is that we feast on Jesus every day. And it's not that we need 10,000 calories of Jesus. We need 50,000 calories of Jesus, right? We, We need to constantly be feasting on Jesus. And then as we're constantly feasting on God and his grace, here's what happens. We are then fueled, we are motivated, we are shown how to do what Paul says to do in 1 Timothy 4.7. 1 Timothy 4.7 says to discipline yourselves for godliness. But the only way you can discipline yourself for godliness is if you've been feasting on Jesus. And so the way that you abstain from the passions of the flesh is you keep coming back to Jesus. Right, you keep looking at Jesus. You keep feasting on Jesus. You keep bathing in his grace and his mercy. And then as you do that, you won't want sin anymore. You won't want flesh anymore. You'll want to discipline yourselves for godliness because you know that the more godly I am, the more Jesus I get. And, and when you get a taste of Jesus, you don't want anything else. When you get a taste of Jesus, he becomes unignorable. He becomes wonderful. This is why Peter said earlier in this book and why the psalmist says in Psalm 34, 8, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, We've got to live like Jesus is better than our sin. Next, we see to live like Jesus matters for your neighbor. Live like Jesus matters for your neighbor. Here's the thing. Every believer is called to live on mission. We're called to live on mission, not only in what we say, but also in how we live. So what this means is, is that we've been called to live on mission, and the the two ways that we live on mission is we share the gospel, but then we also live gospel-saturated lives. Because if you are sharing the gospel, but not living a gospel life, a gospel-flavored life, then you are going to disqualify what you have said over here, right? You're going to make it null and void. Now, some, I gotta be careful saying this because some people will say like, yeah, yeah, even like uh, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. That's not what I'm saying because the gospel by its very nature is words, right? The gospel is verbal. You cannot preach the gospel and use words when necessary. That's like saying, tell me your phone number, but only use numbers if you have to. Right? Like it doesn't, the gospel is a message. This is why Paul says in Romans 10, how will they believe unless they hear, right? He doesn't say, how will they believe unless they see? No, he says, how will they believe unless they hear? And how will they hear unless we preach, right? And so we, we as believers, we've been called to live on mission, not only in what we say, but, but also in how we live. Now look at verse 12. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. He says, because of their current condition, their conduct among unbelievers must be gospel flavored. Now he says, keep keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. If you remember last week, Peter painted this picture of believers and of the church as the new Israel. And so now what he's doing is he's, he's staying with that line and now he's contrasting it with Gentiles. And how do we know that? Well, we know that because Peter is writing to a primarily and a predominantly Gentile audience. And so he's using Gentiles as shorthand here. And he's saying, keep your conduct among the Gentiles, among unbelievers, is honorable. I love that word honorable. I love the way that he describes this conduct. 
Because understand, he, he's not saying, keep your conduct among unbelievers good. He, he doesn't say, keep your conduct among unbelievers polite. No, he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles is honorable. Now this, this word honorable, it, it's to rise to another level. In fact, another way that this could be translated, and I love this, is keep your conduct among the Gentiles as good, right, and beautiful. That's a, a lifestyle that commends itself. That people notice it because it's different. But understand this. This kind of lifestyle isn't just different. It's attractive. That, that people see this lifestyle and they think there's something different. And that difference is what I need. I'm, I'm convinced that if the church in the 21st century, specifically in North America, if we are going to have a future, right? You can look at the trends and all of the trends are really negative, right? Church attendance is down, baptisms are down, all of these things. All of those things are true, but here's what also true. Jesus is alive and the gates of hell won't prevail against his church, right? So am I optimistic? You bet I'm optimistic, Right? I've got a God who was dead and is now alive. But people, I'll have conversations with people about the need for apologetics. Apologetics is defending the faith. We've got to teach our kids and our students how, to, how do they defend the faith. Let's give, let's give them ways and reasons to believe. And I think we should. I think that we should teach our kids and our middle school students and our high school students how to defend the faith. We've got to make sure they have the faith. We've got to give them good reasons to believe but if that's all we're doing, then we're falling short. I think Peter agrees with this. Listen to 1 Peter 3.15. I'll give you a preview of coming attractions. He says, but, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you. Right? That's apologia. That's apologetics. That defense of the faith. But why do you need to be ready to offer that defense? Be ready to offer defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So what Peter is saying is that the reason people would ask you why you have hope is because of the way you live your life. It is because you have presented the gospel as something that is not only true, but is also good and beautiful. That's the need. Right, the need for the culture is not just presenting the gospel truth. In fact, I don't think the hardest job we have is making people or helping people see that the gospel is true. I see people on Facebook all the time saying, I don't pray, but if you could offer positive vibes to the universe, I would appreciate it. Right? Like if, if you can jump there, like we can get you to the gospel. Right? Like we, we can get you to Jesus. Right? Like I, the, the problem is not getting people to see that the gospel is true. In fact, Romans 1 says that God has written the power, the truth of his power on every human heart. Right, that, that creation is enough for people to see that God is holy and God is powerful. But Paul also says in Romans 1 that the reason people don't believe isn't because they can't see the truth, but it's because they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. That gives me great confidence to share the gospel because when people don't, they say no to the gospel, they don't believe what I know is, well, actually you do believe, you're just suppressing the truth and your unrighteousness. The, the, greatest, the greatest problem is not getting people to see that the gospel is true. Here is the great need, is getting people to see that it's not only true, but it's also beautiful, right? That it's also good and it's also right. And, and sometimes, let's just be honest, like the church has failed at this, we haven't been great at this, but that's what we have been called to. That we would show not only that the faith is true, but also that it's good and it's beautiful. It's not just getting people to see the truth, it's getting people to, to see the beauty. So how do we get people to see the beauty of the gospel? Here's how we do it. We show the world that it's true and beautiful through Christ-honoring marriages. We show the world that the gospel is not only true, but it's also good and it's beautiful through Christ-centered parenting. We show that the gospel is good and true and beautiful through the goodness of Christian community lived out in the context of the church. 
that we show that the gospel is good and true and beautiful uh, through joy and hard work. And through joy and pain and through joy and suffering and through joy and success. The way that we will win the world is not through winning an election or through winning a culture battle. The way we will win the world is by refusing to do anything but be joyful disciples of Jesus Christ. Right? The, the way that we win the world is by knowing that the joy of the Lord is our strength. That's, that's how we win the world. That, that's how we, we win our neighbors. The, the point of this is that they would, that our honorable conduct, that they would see the power of the gospel at work in, their, in our lives. And then what would happen is that they would see their need for it. Now, Peter shows us why we've got to live like this. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So why do we live like this? Well, we live like this to take away the power of accusations. Notice that, that Peter doesn't say you, you live honorable lives so that if they speak against you, if they call you evildoers. No, he says when they call you evildoers. Right? Jesus said, they hated me, but they'll love you. No, that's not what Jesus said. Right? Jesus said, they hated me, and they'll, they'll hate you as well. And so Peter says, look, you've got to live honorably so that whenever they accuse you of being an evildoer, they don't have a leg to stand on. Now, why would they be labeled like that? Why, why would Peter be concerned, or why would Peter say you're going to be called evildoers? Well, here's the reason why. Uh, that these Gentiles, that they no longer, or they now refused to worship the idols of the culture. Right? These were people who, who had probably been known in the, the temples of the idols, the, the temples of the false gods. They, they had worshiped there. They had done things, but now they won't. And so what happens is, or what would happen is uh, the, the culture, the world around them would see that they no longer will worship the idols. And so anytime something bad happens, what the world would say is the reason the, thing, the bad thing is happening is because those Christians refuse to worship. Those Christians want evil to befall us. Now, uh, we don't necessarily have temples to idols the way Peter did, but that doesn't mean that idolatry is any less of a problem in our culture. We still have idols of our culture, idols of pleasure and of power and of finance. You know what I think an idol in our culture is? Autonomy. I think that has become an idol in our culture. And what happens is whenever we refuse to worship at the altar of these idols, what happens is, is we get labeled things like bigots or intolerant. Or they say things like, you're going to be on the wrong side of history. The greatest danger you and I could have is not to be on the wrong side of history, but to be on the wrong side of eternity. Right, that, that, that our greatest fear isn't history. Our greatest fear is God. And so when we refuse to worship the idols of the culture, what, what happens is, is we're labeled all of these things. And understand this, it's not even because of what we do or because of what we don't do, but it's because of what we believe. This is why honorable living matters. It matters so that whenever we're labeled as bigots or intolerant or whatever it may be, we can say, no, we love our neighbors. And it's not just that we say that we love our neighbors, but let me show you how we love our neighbors. These are neighbors who are like us and neighbors who aren't like us, neighbors who believe like us and neighbors who don't believe like us. Now, at the end of verse 12, Peter says they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Some will see this lifestyle. They'll ask questions and they'll turn to Christ. See, we, we don't save ourselves by our good deeds, by our good deeds but, but others may be saved because they saw them. Right? That you don't need your good deeds for your salvation, but your neighbor very well might. Not that you would save them, but that they would see your good deeds and they would wonder, why do you live like that? They would wonder, why are you different? Why aren't you worried? Why aren't you concerned? Where does this joy come from? And let me tell you where this joy comes from. It comes from Jesus. 
Right, that the greatest apologetic, the greatest defense for the Christian faith isn't a logical, rock-solid argument. The greatest defense for, a, for the Christian faith is a life that believes the gospel. It is a life that is committed to the gospel. Now, Peter ends this passage. He says, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. The day, what is the day of visitation? If you're like me and you grew up in a Southern Baptist church, the day of visitation, that's Monday nights, right? That's Monday nights we go do visitation. That's not the kind of visitation that Peter's talking about here. This day of visitation, this is the return of Christ to judge the living and the dead. So knowing that this day is coming should drive us to live like Jesus matters because he does but it should also drive us to live like Jesus matters because our neighbors need to see that. Because Jesus is coming as judge and we want everyone to be ready. See, the scriptures paint this picture that Jesus comes as judge and for those who have trusted him and those who have, who have believed in him and who have put their faith in him, well, they are forgiven and they are protected and they're covered by his blood. But for those who have rejected and those who have rebelled, well, Revelation 19 says that Jesus comes to with the fury of the Father. That in his first advent, his first coming, Jesus came as Savior, but in his second coming, he comes as judge. He comes as Lord. And so, see how we live, it reveals really what we believe about our God, about who he is, and about what he's like, and about what he's done, and about what he's going to do. And there's just two questions I want to ask you this morning. The first question is this, is does your life make it easier for people to see and believe the gospel? Does your life make it easier for people to see and believe the gospel? Do you come in and worship on Sunday mornings and then there's a disconnect between Sunday morning and Monday? Or this week between Sunday and Tuesday? Does your life make the gospel attractive? Does it make people want to question and want to believe? Or does your life hinder people from believing the gospel? Does your life repel people from Jesus? Do, do people see our lives and say, if that's what Jesus is about, I don't want anything to do with it. If that's what Jesus is about, then I don't need Jesus. These believers, we have been called to live lives that bring great glory and great honor to King Jesus. And one of the ways we do that is by living honorable lives uh, among unbelievers. The second question I would ask you is this, is are you prepared for the day of visitation? Are you prepared to stand before Jesus Christ, the judge? You know, the question is not will Jesus return as judge. The question is when Jesus returns as judge. And so if Jesus were to return right now, would you be ready to stand before him? Would you be ready to give an account for your 